So today I'm talking about the DC Extended Universe versus the Marvel Cinematic Universe and how not to make a cinematic universe. <laughs> and to kind of preface this, I'm a fan of both DC and Marvel. At age three, I was dressing up as Batman going up and down my parents' driveway. It was not Halloween in my drift. This was long before there was cosplay. And I had one of the original Spider-Man web shooters, which was a little sucker dart that you could do that action on. So I've been a fan of both Marvel and DC pretty much since birth. But when it comes to the films that have been done since the turn of the century, uh, you might say Marvel has done a better job in terms of development of story characters compared to DC. And so we're going to kind of go through some of the reasons why this is the case. And uh, Christopher Piersnick did a piece in medium.com and he said, the people behind the DCEU are like that guy who goes back to the gym for the first time in 10 years, looks over at the dude with a six pack who's been there sweating every single day, wonders why they don't look the same. They're, then tries to lift the same amount. It's a recipe for disaster. And that's kind of the crux of the matter if you look at what Marvel did in developing this cinematic universe. They took characters that weren't kind of A-list. So Fox Studios, for instance, had the rights to the X-Men. Uh, Sony had, at this point, Spider-Man. And so you had uh, the bunch over at Marvel going, OK, who can we actually develop into this kind of cinematic universe? And uh, you've got DC, which the mythology, the stories that can be told, the characters that can be developed, it should be a natural for them to be able to do this. And if you know film, the ability to take comic books and use those as storyboards to go ahead and develop a film out of it should be quite easy. And yet DC has floundered to a certain extent with this. And so anybody that's a fan of Marvel, they already know that there have been different phases of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. So phase one, we were introduced to Iron Man, the original Avengers, the Incredible Hulk, Thor, Captain America. And all of that culminated in Marvel's The Avengers in 2012. And from there, we had phase two, which was yet another Iron Man film, sequels for Thor, Captain America. The Hulk really didn't resonate as much with audiences, so we have not seen other standalone stories for that character. Then we get introduced to the Guardians of the Galaxy, which was another kind of minor set of characters within Marvel. And you had them kind of expanded in their role and really becoming part of this extended universe. And another Avengers film, Age of Ultron. And then we get introduced to Ant-Man, so there's phase two. And phase three, we're having one of these films come up in theaters this month, Avengers Endgame which, from what I've heard, the trailers are just the first 20 minutes worth of the film, and then we'll be surprised by everything else unless you've read all the spoilers people have released online. And after that, Spider-Man Far From Home. So these films represent transitions in terms of the cinematic universe. We're probably gonna see people die, retire. You'll have new characters that have been developed in previous films already that may get their own stories later on. So what we've seen with Marvel is taking their time to actually flesh out these characters and to develop a coherent story that cuts across all these different films. And, and really, if you think of what is done in the comic books, you see the same thing. It's a crossover story. So you have to buy multiple titles in order to get the complete story. And the same thing is happening with regards to the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Then there's the DC Extended Universe. And so that started with Man of Steel and Batman vs. Superman, Dawn of Justice, probably one of the worst titles ever for a film. <clears throat> and uh, this will culminate with Shazam coming out either this month or next. Anybody know when it's coming out? It's out. It's out now. Like it's out now? Yeah. Okay. It's been getting a lot of advertising space. All right. Well, I don't have TV, so. I know not of such things. <laughs> Aquaman was quite popular in theaters, as was Wonder Woman. So these films have kind of been the high points 
Shazam may be also of this vein. And then for the future, we're looking at uh, kind of going outside of the Justice League characters, Superman, Wonder Woman, Batman, and the like, and going for, well, don't know if the Batman will actually be made at this point, given Ben Affleck has kind of been hesitant to continue on in the role. The Suicide Squad, so if you can't come up with a new title, just put an article in front of it. <laughs> Suicide Squad in 2016, The Suicide Squad, squad in 2021. And also Birds of Prey, so we're seeing kind of an extension, uh, uh, same attempt as what Marvel's doing, introducing us to new DC characters. And uh, DC Extended Universe no longer exists. As of two months ago, they uh, changed the name to Worlds of DC. So trying to go for more of the multiverse that is the DC universe of characters. Uh, I don't know how this is gonna go over. I don't know if this will be an improvement over kind of the hit and miss that happened with the DCEU, which represents these films. So we may see a transformation. We may see a continuation of some of the problems that we're gonna talk about here. So what is going on with the DCEU? <coughs> and there are several things that really kind of transpired over the course of trying to make these films. One is what we call the Nolan effect. There's also the issue of who's actually in charge of the DC extended universe. Uh, what's the old adage, too many cooks spoil the broth. Yeah. yeah, so we kind of have that situation going. Likewise, everyone's favorite punching bag is Zack Schneider. So he's been given a lot of blame for what happened and, of course, as with what I showed in that first slide, this attempt to compete with Marvel, uh, not working out too well. And uh, an issue that is also a problem for some of the Marvel films, which is not having a compelling villain. So if you think of film franchises and also stories, if you've got a do-gooder, they're kind of boring. So you really have to have a well-developed villain in order to carry the story. Because let's face it, if you look at Batman versus Joker, who are you more interested in? It's the Joker in terms of psychology. And so that's also been an ongoing problem. And the Nolan effect, if we look at the Dark Knight trilogy, these films were just amazing in terms of bringing a greater deal of realism to this uh, universe of comic book characters. And the, the gritty, realistic kind of uh, storytelling that you have with Batman Begins, The Dark Knight, The Dark Knight Rises, what was the third one, is that it? Yes, The Dark Knight Rises. So those three films, we had not seen really, with the exception maybe of the Superman films starting in 1978, of really having a grounded in reality, so to speak. Uh, Tim Burton's Batman films were very... Tim Burton? <laughs> what? Were very Tim Burton. <laughs> yes, very Tim Burton. Yeah, exactly. Uh, not really in line with the cinematic universe, very postmodern in terms of this blending of different eras, in terms of costume, uh, architecture, and everything. And so with uh, Nolan's films, you really had not only a dark tone to these films, which was very much representative of the Batman stories from the comic books, but you also had complexity of emotion in terms of the characters, both heroes and villains. And you got to see in this dark universe how things played out for both the hero characters and for the villains. And if you've seen The Dark Knight Rises, or no, excuse me, The Dark Knight, that probably is the pinnacle of those three films. You've got the Joker that no matter what Batman does, the Joker is succeeding. And the frustration and the demoralization that happens to Batman in that film, by the end, you're, you're just seeing this person that's been kind of destroyed, almost. And he really has to literally pick himself up at the end and keep going. And uh, unfortunately, Warner Brothers executives 
they looked at the success of the Dark Knight trilogy and wanted to emulate that in this extended universe of DC films. And so what we call the Nolan effect is making everything dark, dark in tone, dark in terms of characters. And what's happened as a result is instead of having complex stories where you have character development, you instead see kind of a sacrificing of both character development and story for the sake of tone. Uh, think, for instance, in Justice League, you've got, well, well, first, Man of Steel. Superman's supposed to be a Boy Scout. He's supposed to be a very positive, upbeat character in terms of who he is. And you've got him instead being very brooding like Batman in the Man of Steel film. And then doing the same thing in Batman versus Superman, Dawn of Justice. Then you have Aquaman, who also seems to be dark and brooding. Wonder Woman, who seems to be dark and brooding. Nobody has bright colored outfits in any of these films. It's all been very much toned down, toned down in terms of the color scheme. So uh, you then have pretty much every character with the exception of The Flash being dark and brooding. But then Joss Whedon came in, reshot things, and you have Batman cracking jokes, which is not part of his character. There was an attempt to bring levity into that film, and it really seemed like there were two different films, depending on what scenes that Jack Schneider had done, what Joss Whedon had done, so it became even more of a mixed bag. So the Nolan effect, unfortunately, this is seen as the recipe for success rather than going through the source material and really trying to stay true to the characters, what they represent, how they should be filmed. So another issue is who on earth is in charge at DC? Uh, and this has very much to do with who has the role of executive producer. So if you look, for instance, at the Marvel Cinematic Universe and even the Star Wars films, you've got Kevin at Marvel and Kathleen at Lucasfilm that have been able to tie together the creative aspects of filmmaking along with the logistic issues of the economics of it and, and really trying to bring these stories to fruition and coordinating things across different films trying to tell this coherent story. So a great deal of, su of success in Marvel and Lucasfilm in doing this. And both of these are now owned by Disney. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The kingdom of the rat. Yes, the giant rat. <laughs> so the DC universe has not had anything approaching what Marvel and Lucasfilm had in terms of someone to guide this process and be able to see the vision of what directors are wanting to achieve visually and in storytelling, and also making sure that they've got the funding and the logistics and everything to actually bring these characters to life. And so for Warner Brothers, uh, don't quote me on this, but it seems that they've had probably a producer for every single film. So there's not been anyone with a coherent vision putting this together both creatively and on the business end of things. So that's an ongoing problem. Uh, apparently with the worlds of DC, this has been corrected, and now they have somebody in charge that's supposed to play the role of Kevin or Kathleen. We'll see if that happens. And of course, as I mentioned, everyone's favorite punching bag is Zack Schneider. So uh, I need to do a content analysis at some point of reviews of films that have been done by Zack Schneider and see just the level of vehemence and vitriol there is directed towards him. I don't really kind of understand it because in terms of visuals, he really is, he's got a great eye for doing visuals in film. However, <coughs> with The Watchmen, a lot of people took issue with his treatment of that story, which I don't think he can actually film The Watchmen and do it justice. So he made a valiant effort, so credit to him for doing so. And so he was tapped to direct Man of Steel and went with the Nolan effect and made it a very dark film. Superman's supposed to have, you know, orange, or excuse me, red and blue tights, and it became very muted in that film. 
And so if you look at what critics, both professional criticism and also even fans, and they'll talk about the fact that Snyder's very good for doing <coughs> visual vignettes within films, but in terms of being able to bring the story together coherently, he kind of falls short. Um, you saw the same thing with Tim Burton for the first two Batman films. They had great sequences, but an overall story, it kind of fell flat. And uh, various critics on web pages, uh, such as Christopher Piersnick, said, Batman versus Superman felt like three or four movies crammed into one, which if you know the context of that, Zack Schneider, <coughs> Batman versus Superman, um, the running time of it would have been five hours. And the studio executives um, did not want to have, obviously, a five-hour film in theaters. They wanted it to be shorter than two hours in order to maximize the amounts of showing in theaters. And so they went in and did their own hatchet job editing the film. It was not done by Zack Schneider. And uh, Kaylee Donaldson made the point one major area where the DCEU went wrong was in allowing a director and a comic book writer to so heavily define the aesthetic and long-term plan of a multi-billion dollar franchise. Zack Schneider was given an immense amount of freedom to shape what the DCEU looked and felt like, and critics weren't delighted with the results. And this becomes an issue with respect to filmmaking. Obviously, we know that movie studios want to turn a profit. So yeah, they're out to make money. But when you look at the creativity of all the people that are involved in the production, from the director on down to grips, all these people have a vision that they want to see on film. So you have a tension between what studio executives want in terms of maximizing return on investment and the creativity and the attempt to produce art on the part of directors, actors, everyone involved in the production. So what Kaylee Donaldson says, I find somewhat problematic because where is that line between the creativity of people involved in the production and this need to create profit? So business versus creativity. That uh, shouldn't be seen as being mutually exclusive because there have been plenty of instances where we've gotten great works of art out of cinema. So there shouldn't be this kind of duality or tension. And the obvious issue is attempting to compete with Marvel. So Marvel, back in 2008, when they made Iron Man, and in 2012, they made the first Avengers film, there were four other movies in between that in which the characters were introduced and fleshed out before you had this bringing all of them together for a major film event. And Warner Brothers, they have sought to kind of do a shortcut and achieve that same success without doing the heavy lifting, if you will, of developing characters, introducing them, and really uh, developing a coherent story. Keep in mind, one of the things that was a plot device to tie all of these Marvel films together was first off the Tesseract Cube. And so that, kind of introduced us to the Infinity Stones, and through the Infinity Stones, you get to introduce to all these different characters. So think of how in Tolkien's Lord of the Rings, in every book, you get introduced to people because there are hobbits interacting with them. So the only place where you see action, where there's story development, is where there's a hobbit. And so you kind of see the same thing in terms of the use of these Infinity Stones, bringing together all these disparate characters to develop this universe. And so there really uh, is a lack of planning on the part of people developing this DC cinematic universe, given that they are not doing the, the hard work of developing story, of developing characters, and bringing all this together before they decide to do a film like Justice League. There should have been many films leading up to that instead of pretty much three, I think, all told. Yeah. So that's an issue. And of course, as I mentioned earlier, a lack of compelling villains. Both novels and comic books, you see very compelling villains who 
you either can have empathy for them or they're so out there that they are intriguing. Uh, Hannibal Lecter would be of the intriguing variety, but we can relate to, well, Darth Vader to a certain extent. Um, you can have sympathy for him given what he went through. Magneto, of course, if you think of his relationship to Professor X and the X-Men stories, he's kind of Malcolm X to Professor X's Martin Luther King. So you've got one who promotes nonviolence and one who says, no, revolution now. And Thanos, they really did a good job by the time they get to Infinity War of making Thanos a character that we can somewhat understand. Maybe not necessarily relate to, if I were to do the snap, I would not be random. <laughs> I would be very selective in who would be eliminated. Probably shouldn't have said that since it's being wrong. Um, <laughs> then, of course, if you look at Lord Voldemort, this is a character that J.K. Rowling was able to make us relate to him because everything he does is motivated by a fear of death. And so, or at least one of his motivations, that and being power mad. But uh, all of them are complex characters that we on at least some level can relate to them or empathize with them. And they're just very interesting characters. And you see the same thing with Christopher Nolan doing Dark Knight where you've got the Joker. The Joker is probably one of the most complex psychologically villains that have been introduced in the comic books. And this is why you've got Joaquin Phoenix making a standalone Joker film. Um, I'm trying to think of how many different incarnations there have been of the Joker, just from animated series, movies, the Batman series from the 1960s, all of them together. This is a very compelling villain. And so you, you kind of hit pay dirt with the Joker for DC. However, with the DC Extended Universe, what we see really are villains just being used kind of as a setup for furthering the story along. They become plot devices rather than either characters that really demonstrate menace or that we can relate to in any way. They've just been kind of set up to be knocked down in order to get to the next film. And thus, this is probably one of the main problems that we've seen for the DCEU, and it's even been a problem for some of the Marvel films, where they don't do a good enough job of fleshing out these villain characters for us either to understand their motivations or in some way relate to them, as that really makes for a more compelling kind of story. So what's gonna go on from here? Now that it is Worlds of DC, will Warner Brothers kind of revamp how they're doing this? Will they start focusing on story and character development in making these films? Or are they gonna continue on with the Nolan effect in terms of how they are producing this franchise or making these standalone films? So one of the things that was a problem early on for Marvel films, and this has been pointed out on uh, sites such as Ain't It Cool News, you have all these standalone movies where there is no universe in existence. So you get introduced to Ghost Rider, and it's just Ghost Rider. You get introduced to Spider-Man. Spider-Man's on his own with the Tobey Maguire films. So I, I see possibly the same thing happening with DC, where they may not be necessarily making connections between all these different characters to create a universe. And Will we continue to see a uh, sacrifice of character development and story all in the name of maintaining this either dark and gritty tone, or will they, uh, the pendulum sh swings the other way and it might become camp like the old Adam West Batman yeah. series? Or the ones that no one mentions anymore, the Joel Schumacher Batman films. Sorry. Had a moment there thinking of those two films. Nipples on the bat suit. <laughs> oh, man. So it'll be interesting to see what happens with these new films that are coming out, whether Birds of Prey, The Suicide Squad, whether they will be 
truer to the source material in the comic books and make these characters more well-defined and differentiated from one another rather than everybody you know, doing quips, making jokes, and all having the same kind of dark tone to them. <clears throat> and that's what I've got. Any questions, comments, idle threats? Random idle, idle, idle threats. Um, but you were talking about the Nolan effect and the dark tone, but that really goes back to the revamp of Batman as the Dark Knight in the comic books and in the graphic novels. Who did that? Uh, Frank Miller. Right. Miller did that. And so, in, in, a, in a way, Nolan's just building on what uh, had already come, it had already been the reshaping, the, the dark, more psychologically uh, oriented understanding of Batman. Mm -hmm. Now that, that meme has spread everywhere. But uh, it, was, it was a hot thing when it first happened. It was a big change, very successful. Yeah, and I've seen this in other genres where you may have a remake of something like Cape Fear. And the original film, you've got this nuclear family, they're not dysfunctional, so in a way you can relate to them. But in the remake with Robert De Niro yeah. and uh, Nick Nolte in the lead role, now you have a dysfunctional film. I think Nick Nolte was cheating on his wife. The daughter is just ignored, and so she goes and does her own thing and ends up with De Niro. So that really, you, you didn't have any empathy for the characters at that point. And so there's kind of a, well, so what? If he kills them, you know, great, they're messed up anyway. And I, I've kind of seen that in science fiction drama. Um, if all of you saw Cloverfield, I was rooting for the monster. And those people, you know, just like, kill them, kill them. So we, we've kind of had the same problem across genres. And I would say part of that is slasher films where let's get to the killing, don't develop characters, it's just set people up as caricatures to be taken out by, you know, Freddy, Jason, Michael, whomever. And I've seen that same kind of uh, diffusion, if you will, into other genres. So uh, kind of a problem may, that may be endemic to filmmaking at this point, a sacrifice of story and character development to get to the action as quickly as possible. Just to throw one more thing out there, that's, but that's that's a, a long-standing problem. The challenge with film is spectacle versus story, and how do you balance those two? And it's now with the the great CGI control of the universe, it's it makes it even more challenging. How do you uh, render a story, which is something that we can empathize with in human terms, with something that is enormous, something that fills the screen and is just a phenomenal spectacle? It's a tough thing to do. Oh, yeah. uh, Dr. Hassan Johnson at FresCon 3, he talked about this juxtaposing the first Christopher Reeves Superman film from 1978 with the first Blade film starring Wesley Snipes. Mm -hmm. And you're a full half hour into Superman before you finally see him in his red and blue tights. And you get introduced to Blade as Blade opening credits. So that kind of compression of time is another factor we're seeing in terms of filmmaking. So we don't have kind of uh, any nuance or uh, creation of mood or atmosphere. It's let's just get to it. Yeah. So how many DC fans are there in here? Even though you're wearing a Spider-Man outfit. I'm usually Green Lantern. Oh, <laughs> Spider-Man today. <laughs> I was going to wear my Spider-Man outfit, but given uh, what you have to do to be able to go to the bathroom... I I'm not looking it. forward to that later. <laughs> <laughs> yes. The perils of cosplay. <laughs> so, how about the rest of you? Marvel fans? Or are you Dark Horse and Image fans? Dark Horse. Acclaimed Comics. Ha! Umbrella Academy, right? <laughs> yeah. Other questions? Inane comments? I like the Schumacher films. You? <laughs> yeah. I, I can look past the, the costume design for the campy, the, the campy ridiculousness. I thought they were stupid and enjoyable. I took my nephews to go see the last one that had Chris O'Donnell and George Clooney and Schwarzenegger as Mr. Freeze. And when we got in the car leaving the theater, I looked at my nephews and they both had this kind of 
well, that sucked. Look on their faces. <laughs> I apologize to them for taking them to go see it. It's like, should have done something else like two razor blades because. Or just watch three episodes of the Adam West series. <laughs> yeah. Or four, I guess. They're all two partners. That's right. Great Scott. If you know the Adam West series. Yes. Which is their version of Great Caesar's Ghost. And that's an influence on comic book films as well. So if you look at the Adam West series, they made it very campy, and so people were very dismissive of comic books as source material for films for decades as a result of that television show. And it really was with Tim Burton making Batman in 1989 where they kind of got back to recognizing comic books as being serious subject matter, not just, you know, pow, all that kind of stuff. Zap. Zap, pow, yeah. <laughs> read the comic books, they don't do that kind of stuff in it as much. It was cutting edge for its time. True. Now they just do thwet, thwet, and snicked for Wolverine. No. That sort of thing. I have my own theory about Adam West having influence on the drug problem in this country, because if you've ever watched the old Batman series, he always had bat pills for something in his utility belt. <laughs> it's like, Robin, are you feeling sea sickness? Here, take a bat pill. So. <laughs> Yeah, either that or Big Pharma, one of the two. <laughs> <laughs> well, any other comments? Yeah. For the movies that went back, do you blame it more on the director or the producer? Or is this the whole company that created a bad movie? I, I would say it's a combination of things. You can't necessarily lay it, lay it at the, the feet of the director. If you've got studio executives and producers that uh, they've set a timeline that can't be met by the production crew, that happened with, uh, what was it, X-Men, Last Stand, X-Men 3. So uh, Ryan Singer couldn't do it in the time frame that the studio wanted. And so they brought in Brett Ratner to make that film. And you could see it in the film. The special effects shots seemed rushed. There was not the kind of development of character that there should have been. And he was under the gun to get it done within a certain time frame. Uh, even there's a, a movie that's out there, the original Fantastic Four from 1994, was made by Roger Corman. And the studio that bought the rights to make a film, they were going to uh, lose the rights if they didn't hurry up and make a movie. And so they hired Corman, and I think he had less than six months to do pre-production, production, post-production. Post and, well, if you've ever seen Robert Corman films. New World Pictures. Yes. Yeah, New yeah. World Pictures. The studio pretty much tried to get all copies of the film, but there were <coughs> bootleg DVDs out there. <coughs> But that was a film that was a rush job. You couldn't blame Corman. He tried the best that he could with what time he had and the resources made available. So you've got problems of how much money is being put for the film, how much creative control is the director being given, and what kind of interference do you have from the studio. And we see the same thing with television shows. Uh, J. Michael Straczynski, when he made the uh, follow-up series to Babylon 5, he made Crusade. And that only lasted a year because TNT, the studio that was backing it, they wanted to turn it into like professional wrestling rather than a science fiction series. And so he struggled with them for a year and after that pulled the plug on it. So uh, sometimes it's the director, I would say Joel Schumacher for the Batman movies, though you may like them. Uh, but in other instances, you've got way too much in the way of studio interference. And so Batman versus Superman, if we were to get to see a director's cut, it might be a coherent story that actually makes sense. But what the studio executives went in and did, the editing job they did <coughs> was really a hatchet job. And Zack Snyder gets the blame for it, but he wasn't actually involved in post-production. They, they pretty much fired him from that film. So, Sometimes the director, sometimes it's the studio, and sometimes it's all parties involved. I mean, think outside of superhero films, how can you explain a movie like Gigli? Okay, 
not everyone, well, no one yeah. saw it, so. <laughs> but, you know, the problem with the, uh, what the studio wants and what the director wants, that you go back at least as far as uh, Magnificent Ambersons had Orson Welles, and he was shooting this wonderful film, and when he got done, the studio said, no, oh, no. They just sliced and diced it. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And oftentimes, if directors don't like what's being done, they remove their name, and then it becomes directed by Alan Smithy. Yes. So, if you've ever seen a film directed by Alan Smithy, this is always a case where the studio's gone in, they've done cuts to it that the director refused to do or was opposed to, they pull their name from it. And there are many films out there directed by Alan Smithy. He's an immortal director, apparently. Sarah, this immortal director, that's right. Yes. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm concluding mine. I'm the advisor for Frescon, so I have to go make rounds and make sure everything's going okay.